Today in series of Doplexis KL interviews, we have with us Dr. Anirudh Malpani, who's the founder of the world's largest free patient education library, HELP, at www.helplibrary.com. He's an IVF specialist who has won over 20 gold medals during his academic career. He has pioneered the use of innovative technology to educate infertile couples using cartoon films, comic books, and e-learning on his website, www.ivfindia.com. He's also an active angel investor, investing across all domains. His passion is patient empowerment and he believes that using information technology to deliver information therapy to patients can heal a sick healthcare system. Thank you so much, Doctor, for the interview. So let's begin with the first question. Uh, doctor, could you please elaborate on the IVF process? So I think when we started, which was over 30 years ago, people had no idea what IVF was. In fact, you still called it a test tube baby. And there were patients who would think that, oh, you know, you'd make a little baby for them in a test tube and give it to them. I think fortunately, thanks to the media, thanks to the press, people are much better informed and they understand that IVF is a medical technological solution to the problem of infertility. Effectively, the best way of thinking about it is that this is how we explain to patients because they have so many myths and misconceptions that IVF babies are weak, that they're abnormal, they will have all kinds of problems that we say all we're doing is that what is not happening in your bedroom for whatever reason, either it's a sperm count problem or a block tubes or anything else, we're doing in the IVF lab for five days, making an embryo and then putting the embryo back in the uterus. I think it's important that doctors learn to demystify what they're doing when they're talking to their patients. Doctors tend to use too much jargon. I think sometimes we take pride in the fact that we do such complicated stuff. And I think especially for doctors who are frontline doctors, which is whether you're a family physician or whether you're a gynecologist, you are the point of first contact for that infertile couple. And the advice you give, the counsel, how well you do it makes such a world of a difference. A lot of times, a lot of these doctors feel, well, you know, I'm referring my patient to an IVF specialist. Let the IVF specialist handle all this stuff. And I think that's a big mistake because our life as IVF specialists becomes far easier if you as the referring doctor have actually done all the homework, counsel the patient appropriately, so our job becomes much easier. So moving on to the next one, what are the important points doctors need to remember during IVF? Again, I think great question. The reality is that most doctors have never been into an IVF laboratory, never seen an IVF clinic. They have no idea what goes inside. Sure, they've read all the textbooks, they can answer all the questions, but there's a big gap between theory and practice. And that's why it's so important that you need to be aware of what you're subjecting your patient to when you're sending them through an IVF clinic. The basics are really quite simple. So I don't think there's any need to overcomplicate it. It's just seven simple steps. One is the pre-IVF workup, which means does this patient need IVF and what kind of IVF does the patient need? Something which can be perhaps best done by the gynecologist even before sending the patient to the IVF clinic. Mm -hmm. Then once the actual procedure starts, there's the process of super ovulation where you give the patient injections to help her to grow lots of eggs. Then there is the egg retrieval where you actually take out the eggs mm -hmm. and send them to the embryologist who then the next step fertilizes them by adding sperms either by doing IVF which is in vitro fertilization, or ICSI, where you inject a single sperm inside the egg. You then have an embryo, which you then culture in the laboratory, and then you transfer this embryo back into the uterus with the hope that it will implant, and it often does, and it often doesn't, not something which we can control. And finally, you have the freezing step, where if you have extra embryos, you can freeze them, so the patient can use those frozen embryos for the next baby as well. The point is that if you have this clear seven step framework, it's very easy when you're guiding your patient as to what needs to be done and makes the patient's life a lot easier. Your job as a doctor much better because the patient is inspired by the confidence and the knowledge which you have in the IVF process and the IVF doctor's job a lot easier as well. Let's not forget, you are the one who has the relationship with the patient. As a specialist, really, the patient is coming because they trust you and therefore they're coming to me. If you've already created that trust and we say exactly the same thing, the patient's confidence in the IVF specialist increases dramatically. Uh, so doctor, moving forward, what tips would you give your fellow doctors on building trust uh, with their patients? Okay, I think the most important thing is to be as open and transparent about what you're doing. Please don't treat your patients like idiots. 
Sure, you know, you spend eight years in medical college, you've got a medical degree, your patients have, but they are pretty smart. And especially in this day and age, when they will go to Dr. Google, they will do their homework for themselves. So if you treat them as intelligent partners, they will respect you and it becomes a mutual relationship. I will say one thing. Sometimes what happens is doctors themselves get confused when they go to a lot of these conferences because they don't do the IVF, but they hear all these things. Oh, there's an embryoscope, there is endometrial receptivity assay, there's embryo biopsies. And you know how specialists are? We like tom tomming about the newest toy or the newest equipment we bought. And obviously when you bought a new equipment, you need to use it. So you want to use it on everyone who comes to you. And that's where the referring doctor needs to be skeptical and say, look, this is what's important. Everything else is bells and whistles. So make sure your patients don't waste their money doing stuff which is not important. And I will tell you one simple trick. Now, everyone understands, for example, you don't do a gastroscopy yourself, but everyone understands that if you do a gastroscopy, you will get a video, you will get photographs of what the stomach lining looks like. So anyone can check. Similarly, anytime you send your patient to an IVF clinic, you must insist that the IVF clinic give them photos of their embryos. That's it. One simple thing you can do to make a world of a difference to the quality of care which your patients get. Because the only thing an IVF clinic can do is make embryos. Once I made an embryo and put it back in the uterus, then I have no control whether that embryo is going to implant or not. That's a biological process. Some of it depends on luck, multiple factors. But if I've made good quality embryos and given photographs, I've documented that I've provided good quality care, the patient has peace of mind, the referring doctor also is happy that I send my patient to the right IVF specialist so that no matter what the outcome, the process was right. So the patient has peace of mind that yes, I got good quality care. Right. Uh, so moving forward, which are the treatment options you discuss with your patients before taking a decision and going ahead with IVF? Great point again. And I think the trouble with us doctors is we kind of feel, oh, I'm the IVF specialist. You've come to me, obviously you come to me for IVF, so why do I need to discuss anything else? Aren't I the super specialist? And I think that's a big mistake. And we always step back and we say, these are your decisions. Ultimately, this is not like you've broken your leg. It's not an emergency situation. You're the one who's choosing to have a baby. You will always have choices. And if you make those choices for yourself, you're in control of your life. Don't do it to keep your mother-in-law happy. Don't do it to keep your husband happy. Do it for selfish reasons. If you're happy, everyone else around you will be happy. So what are your choices? There are always four choices. There are non-medical options and there are medical options. Non-medical options don't need a doctor at all. No, we love each other. We're happy as we are. Child-free is absolutely okay. Good for you. Or we will adopt a baby. Perfectly fine. We're happy to help with that. Or we have assisted reproductive technology, which is what IVF is. And then you have that entire group of what we call third party reproduction, which is donor eggs, donor sperms, donor embryo surrogacy. I think if you use this framework, you'll be able to understand that nothing is very complicated. You can actually help the patient to make up their own mind for themselves. And if you stand by your patient at this time of need, they will be extremely grateful to you, no matter what the outcome of the treatment can be. What else can a doctor want? The happiness of their patient because they know that they've been treated well by a good professional who's put their interests first. Right. Uh, so, doctor, my next question to you is, how do you handle your patients if the IVF cycle fails? Yeah, and that the reality is that no matter how good a doctor I am and no matter what I do, IVF cycles are going to fail. So, rule number one, prepare them for failure before you start. Now, this might seem like a very negative thing to do and a lot of patients say, God, you're so pessimistic. You're talking about failure. We heard you're a great doctor. We've come to you for a baby. You should be talking about success. And I tell them, look, if you get pregnant, you're happy, I'm happy, you're, I'm the best doctor in the world. There's no point in talking about successes. So of course we will do our best. We will tell you what we're doing, why we're doing it. That's all taken for granted. But if the cycle doesn't work, you're going to come back to me and I'm the one who is going to answer. So I promise you, I will not abandon you if your cycle fails, which is what a lot of IVF specialists do. They're just not available. Doctor busy hai, time ni hai, humko ni malam. You know, all kinds of stories afterwards. And patients feel cheated. They said, that's not what you told me at the time of the transfer. You told me I had a success rate of 80%. And then what happened? And that's the big problem. Because if one patient has a bad experience with one IVF doctor, she doesn't trust any IVF doctor at all. And she thinks all IVF doctors are crooks, which is sometimes a huge problem. So therefore, we explain to them, this is the three things we can control. We can control embryo quality. So here are photos of your embryos. Your embryos look gorgeous. 
We can check your endometrium, which is where the embryo is going to implant. This is what your endometrium looks like on a scan. And we always call husbands in so they can see that, you know, this is what's happening. It's good for them. And sometimes, you know, you must remember that not only do patients want to know, they're already asking questions, but because they don't have the courage to ask the doctor openly, they're bottling up their questions. But that's not good for the patient and it's not good for me as a doctor. So we encourage that. And finally, the transfer, where we put the embryo inside. I said, these are three things I've controlled. I've done that. Yeah. After this, I have no control. So as long as you're telling them the same story right throughout, the trust in you keeps on building up because they know that, okay, he's not lying to me at least. And that's the beauty about a website, that a website will not allow you to lie to patients. You can't say one thing on a website and do something else. And I think that's why it's so important that patients also do their own homework and doctors encourage patients to do their homework so they ask the right questions. Right. Uh, so, doctor, what are the risks associated with IVF, uh, which every doctor should know? Okay, so I would basically break it down into three risks. The medical risks, the financial risks, and the emotional risks. Medical risks, I think if you're going to a good clinic, are pretty small. I'm not saying they're not there, so you could have problems with multiple pregnancies, especially for irresponsible doctors who put too many embryos back, you have things like ovarian hyperstimulation, where you know the ovaries become large. You could have complications if the doctor doesn't know how to super ovulate properly. But like I said, most of them are manageable. And in a good clinic, if patients are monitored, that's not really such a problem. There are lots of myths about, oh, these drugs will cause ovarian cancer, breast cancer. Uh, you know, women will get menopausal faster. None of that is true. Natural hormones all get excreted promptly no long-term effects, and these babies are completely normal. There's no increased risk of birth defects or anything as a result of IVF. Financial risks, that's the big elephant in the room. This is expensive treatment. Now, I understand treatment is expensive, but a baby is priceless. So that as long as you're getting good quality care, patients are quite happy to invest that money in having a baby. It's when they feel that they've not received good quality care, they're going to be really unhappy about it. So they need to understand that an IVF cycle is not always a single shot affair. It may take two, it may take three cycles. They need to be prepared for that. And finally is the emotional risk. And I think that's something a lot of doctors forget because we're so focused on the technique or the technology or the process which we're doing that we forget we're dealing with human beings who have a heart which breaks. And the emotional risk is that in spite of doing everything, mandir jaungi, masjid jaungi, minnat mangungi, no one can control what the outcome is. And if it does fail, you as a doctor are responsible for holding your patient's hand, giving her a shoulder to cry on so that, yes, we tried our best. I'm sorry it didn't work out. If you like, we can try again or we can consider alternative options. Right. So, doctor, what are your thoughts on misuse of IVF? Okay, now I know this is a very touchy, sensitive issue and it's not going to make me very popular amongst lots of gynecologists and I get that. But I think we need to remember as doctors, it's our job to put our patients first. Everything else is secondary. And one of the biggest problems I find is that people do IVF left, right and center for absolutely no reason. In the sense, these are young women who could get pregnant with much simpler treatment options. But because it's much more profitable for the doctor to do IVF, they do IVF. Now, it's a great way of increasing success rates. Obviously, you know, patient didn't need IVF, do it. She mostly would have got pregnant in a bedroom anyway. But if you do it, she's going to give you the credit and doctors are happy to take that, which is why you see all these full page color ads and all these newspapers and you have all these scams and you have all these billboards and hoardings, you know, come and we will do IVF for you. And hey, guess what? You're too busy to go to Bombay. We will come to your town and we will do the IVF. And I think a lot of that is completely broken. It's not just that. Even the way I think IVF is done, the quality control, the transparency, the reporting, a lot of these are very, you know, the doctor is in five different clinics. You never know where the doctor is. No one seems to know what's happening, right hand, left hand. There's usually an assistant you're talking to because the senior doctor themselves is not available. And that's why sometimes the entire way society in general looks at the medical profession itself has taken such a beating in the last 30 years that I don't think people are proud to call themselves doctors anymore. I'm a second generation doctor and I was always proud of the fact that my parents were doctors and they were respected and looked up to. And now I think that respect is everyone kind of always thinks, yeah, yeah, these guys are very rich, but that's because they're very commercial or they're always doing unnecessary procedures. 
And I think as doctors, we should acknowledge the fact that we are responsible for the mess we find ourselves in. If 40 years ago we were held in high regard and today we're not held in high regard, so what is the one thing which has changed? And why, if we take responsibility for the fact that yes, part of it is our fault, we can also take corrective action and improve things. So I will say one thing, I am not a doctor basher. I'm a full-time practicing doctor. I admire doctors who do a good job, but it also breaks my heart when I see doctors who cheat patients. And I think the only way we can do that is by putting patients first and explaining to patients, this is how you can differentiate between a good doctor and a bad doctor. Good doctors are happy when that happens because then patients appreciate and admire what you're doing for them. And the bad doctors are not going to be happy, but we don't want bad doctors to be happy, do we? Uh, so, Doctor, do you think an online platform like DocPlexis can help doctors be updated with new technology and information therapy? I think absolutely. I think there is so much information and it's very hard for doctors to make sense of it. Uh, often, you know, they worry because now patients know a lot more about what's happening than sometimes the doctors do. I would say a couple of things. One is don't treat your patients as adversaries. And if you don't know something, it's perfectly OK to tell the patient that's interesting. Show me what you know and I will tell you whether that's right or wrong. And if it's wrong, why it's wrong? What's my opinion? And if it's right, then, you know, both of us will have learned something. So I use my patients as unpaid research assistants. If tomorrow they have a useful insight, then I will write about it and share it on my website. Not only did I become wiser, I can share that information with other patients as well. And I think online is the way to go. You know, we all carry our mobiles with us. We're always looking at it. So rather than waste time on Facebook, when you have a platform, my one big dream would be that every doctor would have their own website. It would force doctors to be transparent and then doctors wouldn't have to waste time saying the same thing again and again to their patients because they've already said it once in one particular place. So patients are already armed with that information before going to the doctor so that then they can talk not about the general background but what their specific concerns are so that the doctor also enjoys the conversation and so does the patient. Thank you so much, Doctor, for the interview. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thank you.